It's a cold and rainy Sunbelt Saturday night in Statesboro, Georgia, as we welcome you inside Paulson Stadium, where tonight the 21st-ranked Coastal Carolina Chanticleers have come to town to take on the Georgia Southern Eagles. And good evening, I'm Matt Stewart, joined by Danny Wan. Danny, the big news on campus in Georgia Southern this week, the hiring of Clay Helton as the new head coach. Very unique perspective for him as the players on the team right now are now auditioning for next year. He was named head coach on Tuesday, had a press conference on Thursday, and he hit a unique situation for Clay Hell, and he gets a chance to watch the final four games of the regular season. Normally, a coach would come in as soon as the season is over, but... A unique situation for Clay Heldon, and we'll get a chance to talk to him later on the broadcast tonight. Meantime, the Coastal Carolina Chanticleer still in the mix for the Sunbelt East title. They need to win out, get some help with App State, and bigger news tonight as the player of the year, their quarterback, Grayson McCall, is out with an injury. Bryce Carpenter is going to get the start. Carpenter was a starting quarterback for Coastal Carolina in previous years before Grayson McCall stepped his foot on campus in Conway, South Carolina. And get this, Carpenter played against Georgia Southern two years ago in the Statesboro on a rainy Saturday night. That game resulted in a triple overtime victory for the Eagles. So we'll see what Carpenter is able to do as the Chanticleers start out their final stretch. It's the Coastal Carolina Chanticleers and the Georgia Southern Eagles on military appreciation night. Eagles trying to snap a three-game losing streak. Chanticleers going for win number eight. Eighth all-time meeting. Opening kick is coming up next. Back in Statesboro, you're watching Sunbelt football on ESPN. On a nasty Saturday night, temperature in the mid to low 40s, and the rain looks like it's going to stay for the entire ball game coming in from Savannah and moving up inland through the state of Georgia. Is Coastal Carolina and Georgia Southern going to play in these conditions? It'll be interesting, interesting to see, Danny, how that impacts tonight's ball game. Well, we kind of touched on it earlier at the top of the broadcast. This was a similar situation two years ago, and that's when – both of these teams made headlines because we were having a dance-off on the sidelines going into the fourth quarter and resulted in a triple overtime win for Georgia Southern. And it'll be interesting to see how things might reflect similar from two years ago or if things change up tonight. You see Jamie Chadwell, one of the hot young coaches in college football, has taken this Coastal Carolina program to great heights, 11-0 in the regular season a year ago, but playing tonight without his star quarterback and Kevin Whitley in his fifth game as the interim head coach of the Georgia Southern Eagles. And in that shot right there, you can see just how hard it is raining right now. It seems like the rain continuously picked up in the last 30-ish minutes. It's been raining all day, but now with uh, additional rain making its way up from Savannah, we'll see how it impacts the turf and how it impacts both teams. Britton Williams has it teed up and ready to go for the Eagles, looking to snap that three-game losing streak that has dropped their record to two and six and one and four in the Sun Belt East, fifth place in the division. And Coastal, App State has already won today, so Coastal needs to win to keep pace. Of course, the Mountaineers beat the Chanticleers a couple of weeks ago on a last-second field goal. They're going to run a reverse on the kickoff. And out across the 30-yard line and stumbling up to the 40-yard line on the return, the Chanticleers and great field position as Braden Bennett took it up close to the 40-yard line and some talking going on at the end of that opening play. It's already started <laughs> right on the kickoff. And how about that for Coastal Carolina goal with some trickery on the kick return? So we'll see how the Chanticleers respond with Bryce Carpenter at quarterback, the senior out of Sarasota, Florida, and Venice High School. But he has been in this role before, just not much this year. Pretty much just mop-up duty so far this season. He did play a little bit against Troy last week. Didn't throw any passes. Had two rushes for 12 yards. Overall, as you see his number, he's only completed 11 passes out of 19 total attempts. But he has two touchdowns, and as we mentioned, he was a starting quarterback a few years ago. And he did play against Troy, as you just pointed out, and that was the play that it appears that uh, Grayson McCall was injured on against the Trojans. And he tried to go and practice in the days since that game against Troy. 
And given the conditions here today and given the fact that he has not been that effective in practice since that Troy game, Coach Jamie Chadwell electing to go with Bryce Carpenter today. Now the play is under review. So I'm not quite certain what they're even looking at. The play as it ran to our near sideline kind of went out of our view as they ran in front of the Georgia Southern bench. So I think perhaps the review is to determine where Bennett. That video review on the field has been confirmed. First spin for Coastal at the 35 yard line. Yeah, they wanted to determine where he had stepped out. So they decided it was the 35 instead of the 40 where it was originally spotted. With Carpenter starting, we spoke to co-offensive coordinators for Coastal Carolina. They mentioned that, you know, there, there's no selfishness between the quarterback room. It's all selfless. They, they never talk about getting more touches. They're always there to support their teammates, and it gives them a lot of confidence. Also for the Chanticleers tonight, Danny, no Reese White as he is injured, and Bennett gets the first toss of the game, and he gets 10-plus out close to the 50, more like a 15-yard gain for Braden Bennett, the redshirt freshman, getting the first carry of the contest. We're going to see a little bit of Bennett throughout this game for the Chanticleers, along with McCall out. Reese White is not playing in today's game, and he had seven rushing touchdowns on the season. Just great spacing for Bennett on the first down run. So Bennett, after returning the opening kickoff to the 35, picks up close to 18 on that play as they spot it at the 47, first and 10 for the Chanticleers. Carpenter on a quarterback run. And Carpenter gets dropped at the 44-yard line. Randy Wade and Eldrick Robinson in on that tackle for the Eagles. Carpenter can run the ball when needed for the Chanticleers. That time had plenty of space, tried to move a little bit upfield, got a gain of three. And for Georgia Southern's defense, Eldrick Robinson, who made the tackle, has continued to improve since earning the starting job a few months ago. Second down and seven. The Eagles have been going with freshman inside linebackers most of the season now. And Carpenter on another run. And that's C.J. Wright, who we thought might be done for the season when he suffered a knee injury last week against Georgia State, but right back out there in the starting lineup today. We were very concerned for, for C.J. Wright when he went down against the, the Panthers last week. But when we talked with defensive corner Scott Sloan, he mentioned that with C.J. Wright squatting over 600 pounds, that may have helped keep his muscles intact, and that could have changed things. If he was a guy that may have squatted 230 pounds, he probably would have been in surgery right now. He is one powerful dude, Danny. At 6'285", the senior out of Sylvania, Georgia, in Scriven County High School. Third down and four now. And the handoff goes to Shamari Jones, and he gets stacked up at the line of scrimmage and does not pick up the first down. You see Dylan Springer losing the helmet there and coming out of the pile all fired up, and it's fourth and three. Chanticleer's head coach Jamie Chadwell mentioned that third downs were going to be the key. See here, just great read from Springer, able to come from behind and make the tackle. Third downs are going to be a, a key moment for both sides, and so far for Coastal Carolina, they're 0 for 1 to start. So Overson is on to punt for the Chanticleer as they elect not to go for it on fourth and three, even though they're 7 for 7 on fourth down conversions this season. Overson, their super senior punter, going to pooch it to the far sideline. They've got coverage down there. And it's going to roll dead at the 12-yard line. So the Chanticleers have pinned the Eagles with poor field position to start this ball game on offense. And there's the new head coach of the Georgia Southern Eagles, Clay Helton. Most recently, the head coach at Southern Cal actually spent more than a decade with the Trojans, moving up the ranks from quarterback's coach to OC to head coach until September. Even though he's been out in Los Angeles for the last 10 years, he was born in Gainesville, Florida, and he spent some time at Duke and also at Memphis. So good to be back in the South and with Georgia Southern moving forward in 2022. Justin Tomlin on the run right there. Gets tackled by Teddy Gallagher, a short gain for the Eagles on their first snap. 
Yeah, he comes from a coaching family. His dad, Kim Hilton, was the head coach at the University of Houston, and he's moved around the ranks. He's been an assistant coach. My first cross pass with him when he was the OC at Memphis a decade ago before taking that Southern Cal job. But a very unique situation as you touched upon it in the open, Danny. Usually head coaches are hired at the end of the season. He comes in with a month to go, so he gets to observe these players not only playing, but also practicing in meetings, just walking around campus. He gets a unique perspective that most new head coaches don't get to enjoy. Also keep in mind, he is hands off with the team in the final four games. He wants to honor the coaching staff and honor those players to finish out the regular season. But he will be watching Logan Wright on the run, going to get cut down, and that's going to be fourth down. Great defensive pursuit there by Jeffrey Hunter and to Jordan Strong, and it's going to be fourth down, and the Eagles a three and out. Quick three and out. They had a Tomlin with a three-yard loss, and Logan Wright in the last two carries had a gain of three, but then was sent back one yard. It's a good start from the shot to clear defense. They're in multiple front, but they use three down linemen for the most part and then have different linebackers and different schemes that they may show, which makes them so dangerous, and they only give up 18 points a game as well. Here's Anthony Beck. He's one of the top punters in the entire nation, up for the Ray Guy Award, Ray Guy Punter of the Week this past week. And he blasted out of there. Kick goes all the way to the other 40 where it's fair caught by Javon Hiley and we'll step aside as the Chanticleers get ready to come out on offense for the second time. It's the kind of weather you would expect the military to encounter when they're out on maneuvers. It's 47 right now, feels like 41 and raining. This is the eighth all-time meeting Last one coming last year in Conway, Coastal 28-14 winners. Georgia Southern won the first ever meeting, and the Chanticleers have never won here at Paulson Stadium in two tries. So the third matchup between these two teams in Statesboro. And like you said, Matt, they have not won here either. So first and 10 for the Chanticleers from the 40, and pass goes to Likely, and Isaiah Likely gets cut down after a one-yard game by Seth Robertson. And the Eagles woefully thin at cornerback after the loss of Tyler Bride to a concussion last week. Carpenter with the dump off pass and good blocking by the receiver has likely got a, a short foul. game. But Illegal blindside block, offense, number 11. Can't do that when <laughs> you're right there. So first down. The Cameron Brown, number 11, the wide receiver for Coastal, just as you were praising him for a great block, it was whistled for a blindside. And there you see right there on the, on the block to Tyrell Davis for Georgia Southern. You mentioned how the Eagles are thin in the quarterbacks in the cornerback spot. Excuse me, Derek Canteen was out earlier in the year. Tyler Bride suffered a suffered an injury last week against Georgia State. We are we're happy to hear that he is doing all right. He could be back before the season ends. But Najee Thompson, who began the season at wide receiver, a career wide receiver. For the Eagles, seeing number six right there in the screen. He's playing and starting at corner tonight as Carpenter gets a lot of it back right there on the run to the original line of scrimmage. That was great blocking by the Chanticleer O-line. There you see Carpenter just following the blockers on his way through. And Wilson, Anthony Wilson for Georgia Southern made the tackle. You kind of get the impression that with the conditions here tonight, we've seen a lot of quarterback runs, that this would not be a good night for Grayson McCall with the upper body injury to be running the ball. Obviously, that's a big part of their game plan here tonight with Bryce Carpenter. And maybe a big reason why they decided to go with him in the starting role this evening. Pass is complete out on the edge. Short gain on the play. And that was Bennett again, Braden Bennett, who had the first touch of the game on the kickoff return and on a run to start the game, and he gets his first pass rece reception of the night as well. You're not going to see many passes from Coastal Carolina here with the rain, but they are effective on both running and throwing the ball. They average 231 yards on the ground and 291 in the air. They've been an explosive offense all season long. You can see the rain pelting down here at Paulson Stadium. Carpenter to the air again and nearly intercepted by Daryl Baker as he jumped in front of the pass, and it's going to be fourth down. 
Another three and out stop by this Georgia Southern defense. The cornerbacks that are available for Georgia Southern have done a great job on this drive. This time, Baker jumping out in front of Javon Hiley, who is the intended receiver. So Overson is on the punt again, standing at his 30-yard line. And Caleb Hood standing deep for the Eagles back at the 15. Line drive kick that barely clears the line of scrimmage. Going to continue to bounce. A rugby-style kick that ends up rolling dead at the 12. So about the exact same field position the Eagles had for their first possession. They'll have for their second after this timeout. In Statesboro, scoreless game, Georgia Southern and Coastal Carolina. The Eagles offensive line, they've started all eight, in, eight games this season. That offensive line, over 100 career starts between them. Rolled up over 400 yards of offense last week, Danny, against Georgia State, but managed only 14 points. But OC Doug Roos had no complaints with the O-line. They've been playing well as a unit, and the communication has been great. You also have to give credit to offensive line coach Jeep Wade in his first season with the team. Seems like going to be a false start on one of the old linemen for Georgia Southern here. And that's what happens when you talk good things about it. <laughs> Five yard two. First thing. Couldn't see who they identified as the offender there, but that's going to back the ball up to the seven yard line. I'll tell you what, both punts from Coastal Carolina, they haven't been high and deep, but they've gotten great bounces going down the field, putting the Eagles in a, in a rough spot. First and 15. This should be a free play for the Eagles as Coastal Carolina jumped offside, it would appear. Tomlin gains one yard on the play. We'll check the penalty call. Kyle Olson is our referee tonight. Offside. It's number two. Go first down. You see the jump by the nose, Travis Geiger. And so they get the five yards back, so it's back to first and ten, just where we started. You hear that noise in the background. It sounds like popcorn. That's just the rain pelting down on the field in our field level microphones. So Tomlin gets dropped for a loss back at the nine-yard line. Silas Kelly with the TFL. Chanticleer's defense has been great throughout this season. Kelly had ten tackles against Troy last week with a big piece of the defense. And Gallagher and Kelly, those two inside linebackers for the Chanticleers, really are, you know, kind of the bell cows of that defense for Coastal Carolina. And Chad Staggs, their D.C., says they really bring as much intangible to the table as they do actual production. Pass incomplete, trying to get it out on the edge to Logan Wright. And now it's going to be third down and 13, and the Eagles offense is stuck in neutral right now. The rain playing a factor there. Just slipped off the hands of Logan Wright. He has 11 receptions on the year, but that time just couldn't hang on. We're really starting to see how the rain plays a factor early in the first quarter. I mean, we've only seen one big play throughout the whole game, and that was the first run from Coles Carolina's offense. Third down and 13. And Tomlin going to follow the block of Logan Wright and run it up to the 21-yard line. He will be close to a first down there. So first big gainer of the night for the Eagles as Tomlin... Fake the hand off the right and then just followed him through the hole. See a great pull block over here from Khalil Crowder, the right guard, and following Logan Wright to get through. Just a, a tad short of being four from one. They're not going to go for it. So the Eagles will have to punt again. Anthony Beck, who delivered a 49-yard punt on his first attempt, standing back at the six to let this one go. And Hiley standing deep for Coastal at the 40. 
Very little rush this time as Beck. Hiley is going to field it in the air at the 42, and that's where Coastal will go on offense for the third time tonight. So Coastal going back on offense here for the third time at the 42-yard line as we are now joined in the booth by Clay Helton, the new head coach of the Georgia Southern Eagles. We're trying to get situated here. Good to see you, Clay. Good to see you. And... Uh, Tell us what it feels like to be the new head coach of the Georgia Southern Eagles. You were greeted by a rainstorm, and the crowd gave you a nice uh, standing ovation and a cheer as they introduced you to the crowd here at Paulson Stadium a few moments ago. Just excited and humbled uh, to be a part of this tradition of excellence has been Georgia Southern over the last 40 years. And uh, just the fans, uh, how great they've treated me, my family. Uh, it's been a humbling experience, and uh, just looking forward to getting started. How's it feel to be back in the South? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> back <laughs> I, home, right? I, I tell you what, I think I drank two gallons of sweet tea yesterday <laughs> when I landed. So uh, it, it's great to see how important uh, Georgia Southern football is to this fan base and what it's about and looking forward to uh, looking forward to getting going and being there for them. So the Chanticleer is back on offense. And the gang tackling there by the Eagles. So kind of take us through how this is going to work. This is kind of yeah. unusual yeah. that a coach gets hired in the middle of the season. Mm -hmm. Typically it comes after the season. <laughs> So a little bit of a unique opportunity for you to observe things, mm -hmm. evaluate yeah. things, and check out players, not just in games, not game tape like mm -hmm. you typically would mm -hmm. do, but in games, practices, classrooms, meetings, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, so because of Jared uh, Benko's proactiveness, it really allows us to evaluate our current players, see where our strengths are, see where our areas of growth are, but really start our recruiting process off also over the next 40 days. So a lot of advantages to being here early. So third down here, third and four for the Chanticleers. Carpenter scrambling and throwing low, and that's going to be incomplete. Shamari Davis, the intended target, and it's going to be fourth down in another punting situation here. Kind of miserable conditions, so you get to see Georgia Southern trying to uh, perform here tonight. Not only Georgia mm -hmm. Southern, but also Coastal, future opponent for you, under some uh, pretty adverse conditions. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've always said we don't got to be or we get to be here. So to be here and watch this team play uh, and see the spirit that they're playing with defensively, playing really good football right now, it's exciting as, as, as the next head coach. So Overson on to punt again, and end over end kick. Caleb Hood looks up into the rain and fields it at the 16-yard line. And so the Eagles go on offense for a third time here, again with poor field position as they've had for their first two possessions as well. So I know a lot of Georgia Southern fans are very interested to know what will the Georgia Southern Eagles look like offensively and defensively under Clay Helton? Yeah, definitely. You know, I've, I've been an offensive coordinator for a long time. I've always believed that you play to your strengths. And when I look at this football team and look at the depth of running back and how, how talented the run game can be, uh, you can lean on that run game. But also I think that we have some explosive weapons that are going to allow to be able to push the ball down the field vertically uh, and be able to use those quarterbacks, uh, you know, to be able to throw, throw it over your head, uh, throw it over their heads as we're running the football. So excited about uh, using both those attributes. Run up the middle by Gerald Green as he takes it up close to the 25-yard line. You mentioned recruiting mm -hmm. the, the, the first signing day. There's two of them. The first comes in the middle of December. Uh, when does that start for you, or has it already started? Have you already started making contacts and reestablishing connections in the southeast? Yeah, definitely. It started uh, this morning, to be a fact. And we had about five hours worth of recruiting this morning, uh, of being able to uh, be able to visit with our current commitments as well as uh, kids that were on campus. And it, it's really one of the big advantages of taking this job early is to be able to establish those relationships about 40 days out uh, from uh, the early signing day. Gerald Green on the run right there, and that picks up a first down for the Georgia Southern Eagles. And in a moment here, I'm going to let you kind of break down some plays as we watch it while I ask you these questions as 
as well. But I said reestablish connections. Mm -hmm. uh, not really, because you've been recruiting the Southeast for a long time, yeah. even as the head coach at Southern Cal. Mm -hmm. Typically, as the Trojans head coach, you guys came in and got big-time prospects out of mm -hmm. the state of Georgia quite regularly. Yeah, well, the first half of my career was in all in the Southeast, and now having the opportunity when, when I was at USC to, to recruit nationally, this has been a great area. and You know the recruiting base, the state of Georgia, the talent base that it has, as well as the surrounding states. You could basically draw a 250-mile circle around Statesboro and, and get a lot of great talent to build a championship football team. Well, kind of tell us how this uh, all came about, because as I mentioned, the timing is a little bit unique and unusual mm -hmm. as to how things usually operate mm -hmm. with a guy getting hired. Uh, you were available as of September. So when mm -hmm. did things start clicking and this start all coming to play? Yeah, this came up about possibly about three weeks ago. Uh, you, you know, it started with a simple phone call by Jared. That was supposed to be a 10 minute phone call <laughs> turned into over an hour. And just to see his vision of what the, of what him and Dr. Murrow want this program to be really heightened my attention went through um the uh basically the interview process met with the committee met with the leaders uh, of G georgia southern and just fell in love with it uh and uh, like i told jared if given the opportunity i'd walk from california to get here and, <laughs> and i'm so glad to be here and be with this football team so first and 10 for the Eagles here. Kind of scout this play for me right here. Yeah, a little RPO uh, out to the field. Good job of breaking the tackle. You hope to get those one-on-one -on -one situations, be able to read the alley defender. Good job. Uh, good job right there by Justin being able to read that alley defender, getting it out in space and, and way to make a man miss. Yeah, and Tomlin coming off a career-high passing last week mm -hmm. despite the loss to Georgia State. He's really started to develop as mm -hmm. a passer as the opportunities have come to him more and more. Yeah, definitely. You, you know, I, I think you know when you talk about this run game that that we have you know the ability to create those one-on-one -on -one situations out there and hit them is ultra important in being able to be an effective offense so first and 10 from the 49 yard line and the keeper and tomlin drops the ball but is able to fall right back on top out of the 49. When you were talking, you said we. How how unusual is that? Or are you already getting accustomed to the we part when you talk about Georgia Southern? Well, I say we because anytime you get a, to get in front of uh, kids like I did the other day in front of that team meeting and, and start developing those relationships and shaking kids' hands and tell them how excited you are. I've reached out to all our kids and being able to just start building those relationships are important. So, yes, it is we and cheering hard for them tonight. Second down and 11. Tomlin running option here. Going to keep it and run it down to the 44-yard line. You join Georgia Southern in time for four new members to be joining the Sun Belt Conference here yeah. over the next couple of years. James Madison today just formally introduced. And I think the Sun Belt here in this new you know, realm of expansion, realignment has positioned themselves as certainly maybe the top group of five conference in the nation. Without question. It's one of the reasons that really intrigued me about this job. I think Commissioner Gill's done an unbelievable job. While you've seen other conferences break up, this conference is becoming stronger with the teams that brings in and the coaches that it's bringing in. It's going to be one of those elite platinum conferences that really set the, set the standard for college football. Jalen White on the carry right there. And it's going to be fourth down and about four to go. And let's see what the Eagles do right here. Looks like they're going to bring the punting unit on. I have the opportunity to uh, host the Sun Belt Awards Banquet in Atlanta this week and saw Commissioner Gill. And I, I really believe the forward thinking that he and the Sun Belt presidents and athletic mm -hmm. directors had last year in the middle of the pandemic mm -hmm. really positioned this conference for what we're now seeing with the expansion, the four new members, and the ascension of this conference. Yeah, there's unity among the school presence of leadership and alignment in its vision of what it wants to be. So not only is it a strong conference, it's becoming even stronger with the teams that are coming Ray in, Dave, the coaches that are coming in. Five-yard penalty, remains fourth down. So this will give Anthony Beck a little bit more room to work with. What was the players' reaction when you had a chance to meet with them? Uh, I think one of excitement. You know, I had the opportunity. I said, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my personal cell. I want to start developing relationships. That night I, I had so many players <laughs> reach out. I spent the rest of the night just trying to correspond with them. But I think there's an energy. If they want, they know what this, this university represents. They know the tradition of excellence and the history and the legacy of this place. And they want to win championships. And they're willing to invest to be able to do that. And Beck is going to drop that down at the nine-yard line as Highly calls for the fair catch. And that's where Coastal is going to go back on offense with 
One minute to play here in the first quarter. So how about the family and getting acclimated and moving from the West Coast, moving to Southeast Georgia, moving to Statesboro? When does all that start in motion? Yeah, you, you know, I, I, me and Miss Angela, my wife, we've always had three children by birth and, and 120. We've always got the <laughs> honor to adopt. And, you know, our last, our, our last, our youngest son is 18. We're getting ready to be empty nesters. He lost a big playoff game last night. We're going to get him through high school, hopefully get Miss Angela here by, by the summer. But she's going to come to the BYU game, which I'm really excited about and be a part of that here in two weeks. And that'll be the next home game for the Georgia Southern Eagles and their home finale. And then the regular season will wrap up at App State, the big rivalry game for Georgia Southern. Good strong defense by the Eagles here tonight, following up on a strong mm -hmm. defensive performance last week against Georgia State. Yeah, definitely. I, I tell you what, it's going to be imperative tonight, especially with this weather. Play good defense. Don't turn the ball over. Play great special teams. And, and hopefully, you, you know, you get Coastal Carolina to, to make a, a couple errors and give us field position. We've been playing on a long field right now, but we got a chance to shorten that field on this drive right here. All right, final half minute of this first quarter. Some final words for the Georgia Southern fans who are watching tonight tonight here on ESPN about what you anticipate and look forward to in this program. Well, excited and humbled to be a part of it. Cannot wait to get started and promise them they're going to get every ounce of energy that we have as a staff to bring back championship football to Statesboro. Long run by Carpenter right there, and it looks like he's going to be close to the first down, stopping the clock with 12 seconds to go here in the first period. So what's the week going to look like typically for you? Well, you know, we're going to get started this week of uh, being able to start to watch practice and being able to evaluate, like I said, our strengths and our areas of growth as a team. It's going to allow me to identify our immediate needs and, most importantly, recruit. Um, I'm, a, I'm a lot better coach when there's great players around me, so uh, we're going to recruit as hard as we can. Coach Elton, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Congratulations on the new job, and we look forward with great excitement to see what you're going to do in stage four. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. That's Clay Elton, the new head coach of the Georgia Southern Eagles, into the first quarter, scoreless here in stage four. Start of the second quarter and an absolute deluge here in Statesboro right oh, now. Matt goodness. Stewart along with Danny Waugh. No telling what's going to happen tonight under these conditions. So far scoreless after 15 minutes. It's third down and one for Coastal as we start the second quarter. And Carpenter's going to run for a first down up to the 30-yard line. Anthony Wilson making the tackle. He waited to the very last second. He thought he was going to pitch it out. Instead, kept it, and a flag's on the play. Holding. Offense. Wow. Number 79. 10-yard penalty. Third down. That's and on. it's not just rainy. You can see the pants legs of our referee whipping in the wind right there. And you see and there was the hold. You see Steven Badoski, the right tackle, hanging on to the jersey. He's going to send it 10 yards back. So instead of a first down, now it's going to be third down and about 10, a little bit more than 10, a fraction more than 10 at the 10-yard line. And if you're wondering why Bryce Carpenter is at quarterback for the Chanticleers, if you just tuned in, Grace McCall ruled out about 45 minutes before kickoff uh, the result of an upper body injury, and he's listed out indefinitely. They don't know how long he's going to be out, whether it's just this game or perhaps the rest of the season. He was injured originally against Troy, tried to practice this past week. I think weather conditions has also kind of played a part in the decision here tonight, knowing that your quarterback's probably going to be running the ball even more so than usual. It's possible, and we were told that he, he fought so hard throughout practice to try and be on the field tonight, but pretty much a safety precaution right now. As you kind of mentioned, we don't know how long he is out for, but uh, keeping him out here tonight... Just a safety precaution, and we'll see what Carpenter can do going forward. Of course, the Chanticleers have the luxury of the senior, Bryce Carpenter, who's got plenty of action under his belt in the past. Throws low right there, however, for Cameron Brown, and it's going to be second down. Coastal has really not been that effective. Neither team has in the passing game so far. That's probably not a news flash given the weather conditions, but highly and likely have not been involved much at all Likely has one catch for one yard, and highly their top wide receiver, who averages right at 100 yards receiving per game, has not been targeted yet. This shows how much Sabrina is playing a factor, because that was a great throw from Carpenter, a little bit low for, for Brown to make a reception, but 
with the rain, he kind of slipped out of his fingertips. Second down and 10, and Shamari Jones runs right into the arms of Eldrick Robinson and picks up about seven on the play. It's always the next man up mentality, and we've seen that throughout Georgia Southern's defense. Robinson, one of the guys that really stepped up, even just a, only just a freshman, but he's made some big plays on the defensive side for Georgia Southern throughout the season. So third down and three will call it from the 30-yard line. And again, the Chanticleers also without Reese White tonight. So their top two backs, White and Jones, White not available as well because of injury. It is an absolute mess down there on the field. And I believe a timeout's going to be called by the Chanticleers on third down and three. So while they huddle up here, decide what they want to do, we'll huddle up as well and step aside. Back in the borough, third down and three coming up for Coastal Carolina. Scoreless ball game here through the first 17 minutes. It's third down and three for Coastal Carolina. They've been effective on third downs this season. 58% efficiency throughout the, the year. But Let's face it, Danny. They're effective <laughs> in everything they do. They are over. They average over 500 yards of offense per game. Yeah, but so far tonight, just one of four on third downs. Jet sweep, and that's going to be a first down carry for Bennett. So with Reese out, Reese White out, Jaden Bennett is going to get a lot more carries here tonight. And that was his second rush of the night. He also has a reception as well. And you can't throw the ball as much. That's when you can open up your playbook with some of your trick running plays. And that's what the shot the clears did right there on third and three. Third first down of the game for the Chanticleers. First and 10 from the 35. Shamari Jones, first down run up across the 45 and up to the 47. Tackled by Quinn Williams. He was the leading rusher for the Chanticleers last week against Troy. Had 14 carries for 95 yards. Plenty of open field. Almost a missed block there from, from Likely. Could have been more for Jones. And Jones also had two touchdowns in the win over Troy last week. Jones, a senior out of Pensacola, played at Tate High School, stopped off at Independence Kansas Community College before signing with Coastal Carolina. Shanta clears at 7-1, and 3-1 and one in the Sun Belt. Need a win here tonight to pull back even with App, a top first place in the division. And Bennett cannot hold on to it. And then Daryl Baker comes up to make sure that he could not get a handle on it. When we spoke with Jamie Chadwell about the loss to Appalachian State, he said it was tough because they had a chance. And their confidence wasn't broken, but it was questioned. Carpenter's throw was a great throw over to, to Bennett. Bennett just cannot hang on. Just The rain is continuing to, to increase throughout this game. Yeah, no sign of it stopping. It's supposed to rain all the way through tonight. Second down and 10. They had some heavy bands down around Savannah about an hour before kickoff. And likely that those might be migrating north inland here. And what we're getting right now, Shamari Jones slipping on the turf. And it's going to be third down. Dylan Springer was there as well. The Eagles defensive line, such a veteran group. Springer was getting blocked by Likely. They got pushed in, resulting in the slip-up. Springer, fifth-year senior out of Midland, Texas High School, Trinity Valley Community College. Third down and 11. And Carpenter gets away and throws complete to Shamari Jones. And that will be a first down, but he, I think, was across the line of scrimmage when he threw that ball. There's a flag down at the line of scrimmage. I think he was at least a step over the line of scrimmage when he delivered that ball downfield. 
So I believe the call will be illegal forward pass. Seems what the officials are discussing there. It was a good throw from Carpenter just to try to keep the play alive. During the play, the quarterback went beyond the line of scrimmage and threw a forward pass. That's an illegal forward pass. Offense, number 12. Five-yard penalty from the spot of the foul. Boss it down. Fourth down. So a huge penalty right there. The line of scrimmage is a 47. Got out of Ellis and right just about the 48 is where he threw it. So thought he had some space to get it out. Just a little bit out of place. So Overson on to punt. This will be his fourth punt of the game, average of 35 plus. He's put three inside the 20 yard line already tonight. Heavy rush and he gets it out of there. This one's going to be inside the 20 again as it kicks and rolls about eight, nine more yards. He's really kind of mastered that bounce and roll with that kick. Eagles going back on offense four minutes and a half into the second quarter when we get back. Eagles going back on offense for the fifth time tonight. Their average field position tonight so far has been their own 13. As you take a look at Justin Tomlin, a week ago, career high 279 yards, but also you counter that with the two very costly picks as well. He threw the ball very well against Georgia State last week. He was on a roll in the opening series. His first incompletion was popped in the air. That resulted in his first pick. But it's very rare when Georgia Southern has more passing yards than rushing yards in a game. Tomlin running option, then cuts it up. And Tomlin fumbles the ball, and it's still loose and scooped up by the Shanta Clears at the 35-yard line. And Makonzo comes up with the fumble recovery, and the first big break of the game goes to the Shanta Clears. You see here, Tomlin sticking with it, had great blocking. It's right there, it's great tackling and, and a strip. By Gunter, he by did by a great Gunter, job. Yeah. Gunter did exactly what you're supposed to do. You kind of hold him up and rip at that ball, and he was able to get it loose. That was the first thing I noticed. Gunther had Tomlin up first before he made the strip, so it really gave Tomlin a hard time to try to hang on to the ball. It's a great turnaround for, for Coastal Carolina here in the second quarter. Yeah, it's one of those situations where the runner is trying to get down and the defense is trying to hold him up. The exact opposite, usually the defense is trying to get him down, but in that case, they were trying to get the strip opportunity and they got it. Carpenter looking. It's caught at the 25 by Likely. Isaiah Likely, the 6'4", 240 super senior, and possible first round draft pick next spring. He has eight touchdowns on the year. When you have a tight end at 6'4", 240, and can do both and catch the ball and block as well for your running backs, that's a lot, a, a big thing that prospects like to watch and see. He's got a great opportunity to be a very high draft pick in May. First and 10, ball at the 25. Rain continues to pelt down here at Paulson Stadium. Shamari Jones cuts inside the 20, and Shamari Jones still on his feet down to the 11-yard line, and Georgia Southern trying to do exactly what Coastal just did right there and strip, but not successful. I was just thinking with the rain continuing to, to pour down here in, here in Statesboro, I understand wanting to try and create some extra yardage, but with the ball being slippery, you might just want to go down. I mean, great jukes from Jones trying to break out of some tackles, but after you get the first down, you might as well just go down and hold on to possession. Coastal has committed only four turnovers the entire season. First and 10, ball at the 12. Looking, firing, touchdown, Coastal Carolina. Cameron Brown on the receiving end of that 12-yard touchdown strike from Bryce Carpenter, and Coastal turns the Georgia Southern turnover into points. Third passing touchdown for Carpenter. Third reception touchdown for Brown. And Georgia Southern sent the house on that play. And 
All you had was one on one on the outside. Beautiful slant route from Brown, and it's an easy opening in the middle for Carpenter to make the throw. And you got Cameron Brown, who's been one of their pleasant surprises this season, and they're picking on Najee Thompson. PAT is up and good, and a 7 0 lead for Coastal Carolina. So the Shanta Clears turn the strip of Justin Tomlin into a quick seven. They have the early lead here in Statesboro. Three plays, 36 yards after the fumble recovery and Coastal on top with the 12-yard touchdown pass from Carpenter to Brown. And a torrential downpour here in Statesboro. The 21st-ranked Chanticleers have taken the first lead of the game at 7-0. Kieran Colahan has it teed up and ready to go for the Chanticleers. And the kick coming down at the 5, and that is fumbled by Caleb Hood. He'll pick it up. And he'll go down shy of the 15-yard line. So the Eagles suddenly having trouble holding on to the football. And once again, Georgia Southern, I mentioned their average field position has been about the 13. This is not going to be much better. It's going to be about the 15, it looks like. See, once again, Rain playing a factor. Hood, you know, after you, you pick that ball back up, get a couple of yards if you can, but go right down. You don't want to have another turnover as soon as you gave one up that resulted in a shot to clear touchdown so first and ten for the Eagles this is the kind of night in weather like this where you want to play an old-fashioned field position game that's exactly what the Chanticleers are trying to do right here as Gerald Green gets blown up and dropped right away by CJ Brewer you had two men on each side pushing their way in on Coastal Carolina's defense right there both Brewer and another man for the Chanticleer was just right to the blow to play up. And blown up again. Yeah. Again, the Chanticleers, Makanzo that time feeding on defense and the Eagles going backwards. Second straight loss on the play, third down and long. A lot of veterans on the Chanticleer's defense. I mean, you look at their, their linebacker group, all red shirt seniors or super seniors. They really know how to communicate and lead the charge. Big reason why they're ranked 21st in the nation. They had reached as high as 14th in the nation until that loss in Boone a couple of weeks ago. Third down and 11. Tomlin fires, sets up a screen for Caleb Hood. He weaves through the defense and lunges out to the 25-yard line, and he's got the first down. Hood has the ability to make people miss in open space. Last week, six receptions and 107 yards against Georgia State. Tomlin gets the ball out in time. Great blocking by the receiver. And how about the, the center, Logan Langmire, coming in for an extra block, giving Hood some time to get the first down. You know, last week we saw the Eagles effective in their passes to Caleb Hood and Amari Jones. We haven't seen him targeted yet tonight. But that was very effective against the Panthers last week. And again, over 400 yards of offense, the only 14 points scored. And Coach Doug Roos says, you know, that's really hard to do. It's hard to have that many yards and that few points. But it really goes back to lack of execution and turnovers once they got in the red zone. Got stopped on a goal line situation in that game through a pick in the red zone as well. So second down. Ball at the 25, second down and nine from the 26. Tomlin, that's complete to Derwin Burgess, who had a breakout game last week. He's dropped after a short game, and now it's going to be third down. Doug Roos, the offensive coordinator, also mentioned giving Burgess some more touches, and they did that against Georgia State last week. He had four receptions for 48 yards, and that's what really got the passing game going for Georgia Southern last week, being able to throw out to their slot receivers in open space but with a lot of rain causing some slipperiness on, some, on, on the ball. Want to go more for short passes, and that's what the Eagles have done so far in this drive. Third down and nine. The line to gain is the 35. Tomlin stands in the pocket downfield, and it is caught by Amari Jones at the 50-yard line, and that'll be a first down. 
After two short passes, they decided to go deep, and Tomlin had plenty of space in the pocket, and that's how it got going against Georgia State last week, being able to find those open slot receivers. And you mentioned Amari Jones, and he had five receptions last week, and Gets his first tonight. Yeah, they've moved him from that running back position to a slot back position officially on the depth chart. Now Logan Wright gets the carry. And Logan Wright picks up about four yards down to the 45. That'll be just the third carry of the night for Wright. The Eagles have run for 67 yards prior to that snap right there and passed for 47. Most of the carries in the first half has been by Tomlin. He's ran the ball eight times. Logan Wright being a power back, able to push his way through. And four-yard plays are the key in the Eagles' offense. That's what Doug Roos spoke with us about a while ago. Second down, play gets blown dead. They'll drop a flag right here. Illegal procedure. I'll start. Offense, number 66. Five-yard penalty, second down. It's the center, Logan Langmeyer. And going back to Logan Wright for just a moment, Coach Roos called him an absolute stud. And, you know, he doesn't have that top end speed, but at six foot 230, Coach Roos thinks he might get a look in, in NFL camps next spring and summer. If he had the top end speed, he'd certainly be a high draft pick. And Tomlin has trouble with it and then does not get on top of it, and Coastal might have it again. It looked like Tomlin had gotten back on top of it, but somehow did not find the handle. I'm not sure. I'm not sure he had it. I think Coastal may come out with the ball here. Coastal does have it, it appears. Still no signal from our officials as they pull the players off the pile, and Coastal has it. So Coastal has recovered a second fumble right here by Justin Tomlin. See, I thought he was on top of it right there, but he never did get control of it. He fell on it, and it bounced out from underneath him. He tried to, but right at the last second, he got hit. It's another turnover for Georgia Southern. Coastal's defense has played well. I mean, both defenses played well in the first quarter, and now Coastal Carolina is starting to gain some momentum in the second. Well, Georgia Southern's defense now has been put in a bad situation for a second possession in a row. The previous possession, Coastal took over at the 35 because of a fumble and scored in three plays, and now they take over at the 40. So first and 10, Chanticleers. Four and a half minutes to play here in the second quarter. Right up the middle, Shamari Jones and a first down carry inside the 30-yard line. Jones right there following his blockers on the way through. Nine carries, 52 yards for Jones here in the first half. And he'll get it again. Finds a hole and cuts in it. And bounces down inside the 25 to about the 23. Coastal going no huddle here on... These last couple of plays really trying to catch the Eagles off guard and trying to capitalize off the turnover. They're not necessarily a big up-tempo team. They can do it, obviously, as we alluded to earlier. They do a lot of things really well. One of the top offenses, not only in the Sun Belt, but the entire country, averaging 44 points per game. Second down now and five. 344 to play here in the first half. Option now, Carpenter going to keep it, keep it and cut through the hole. Carpenter on his feet inside the 10 and dives for the end zone. And that is a touchdown for the Chanticleers. Great run by Carpenter to cut through the hole and find the end zone. 13-0 Coastal Carolina. How about that? 23-yard run for a touchdown and... You know, we saw it earlier in the first quarter when Carpenter thought about pitching it out and kept it at the very last second. And, you know, once he got through that first level, he just followed his blockers, bounced outside, and that's a, that's a great run for the senior quarterback. Biscardi on for the PAT. Overson is the holder, and Shrimp is the long snapper, and the kick is up and in, and it's 14-0. 
So Coastal twice now here in the second quarter has cashed in on Georgia Southern turnovers, and they now lead it 14-0. Carpenter, look at that. Little fake right through the hole, and 23 yards later, found the pylon. You can see the river that is flowing from the stands onto the field as the rain just continues to pelt down here. It has been raining since about at least two hours before kickoff and no end in sight. 14 nothing Coastal Carolina. They've been able to manage the elements better than the Eagles. As Hood will take the ball at the five yard line and spin move dropped at the 20 and that's where Georgia Southern will go back on offense with 316 to play here in the first half. Still time for the Eagles offense to get a score before the first half ends. There's 316 left to play in the second quarter. If they can sustain a good drive and move it downfield, they can at least get a touchdown or a field goal before going into the locker room. Eagles have run 23 plays to the Chanticleers 27. The big difference in the ball game has just been field position. The Eagles have been bottled up in their own end the entire game, and Coastal has scored when been gifted with turnovers, taking over at the 35, scoring quickly, taking over at the 40, scoring quickly. And Tomlin going to keep it, and Silas Kelly was there to make him cut back in and fall down. After a loss on the play, it looks like a couple of yards loss on the play. Going to be second down as the clock ticks under three minutes now to play in the first half. It seemed like Kelly was right there waiting for Tomlin. Had eyes on the quarterback the entire time. And didn't get a full tackle. Just kind of touched him. And, and Tomlin tripping up, tripped up there. Second down and 12, ball at the 19. Play action, complete to Hood across the middle. And up to the 35-yard line, Lance Boykin making the tackle for the Chanticleers. First down. That'll be the sixth first down for the Eagles. Hood was shaking up a little bit as he, he went down. You saw him bounce off the turf after getting tackled. 2.25 to play in the half. The Eagles have all three timeouts remaining. Logan Wright, right up the middle. Gerard Clark, the nose tackle there to make the initial hit. Pick up of close to five on the play. Second down as the clock now under two to go at 155. Logan Wright again. Defense collapses in on him. Teddy Gallagher making the stop for the Chanticleers. 140 to play in the half. Georgia Southern going with a hurry-up offense here. Under two minutes to go in the half, trying to catch Deshaun to clear defense off guard. And Logan Wright gets hit in the back and stumbles forward. First down at the 47, and the Eagles hurry up to the line, stop the clock to move the chains, 124. Great focus by Wright there. Managed to stay on his feet. Keep one hand on the ball, one hand on the ground to keep him up. Avoiding a knee, touching the turf. And managed to get a first down. Clock running again. Now at 106. Tomlin quickly fires the hood. He can't hold on to it. Slipped right out of his hands. And Boykin was there to make sure that he dropped it. Stops the clock with 58 seconds to play in the half. Just shows it's, it's been a tough first half for both teams, especially for Georgia Southern on offense, trying to hang on to the ball on certain occasions. Danny, this is where you run that fine line of running the clock all the way down, but also managing your timeouts as well to try to score a touchdown. And they have all three of their timeouts remaining here in the half, too. Yep. Ball at the 46. So they got a lot of time to work with still. Tomlin stands in the pocket. Great protection. Overthrows Hood. Boykin again on the coverage. Jumped in front of him. 
And now it's going to be third down and 10, and the clock stopped with 54 seconds. So now Coastal has two timeouts remaining. You don't want to give them the ball back right now. <laughs> Not at all. So it's really important to get this first down. You want to score points, but you don't want Coastal to touch the ball again in this half. Already up by two touchdowns. Tomlin going to take a quarterback sack. Wow. How about that? Josiah Stewart, the freshman, just beat his man on defense. Gunter is shaken up on the play, but Josiah Stewart, a freshman they've talked so highly about, just came right over his offensive lineman and gets the quarterback sack. He's really had an impressive first year with the Chanticleer. Stewart, that was his sixth sack on the year. Tomlin tried to get it out in time. It seemed like when he was about to throw, Stewart came around to take him down. Clock running at 17 seconds. The Eagles can run it all the way down almost. They're six on the play clock. And they snap it with two on the play clock. And the kick is blocked. And it's recovered. And Shelton has it. And that's going to be a touchdown for Coastal Carolina. And a 20 to nothing lead for the Chanticleers as the Eagles have come unglued here in the second quarter. No flags either. That was a great block by the special teams for Coastal Carolina. And it seemed like everyone was kind of standing and waiting to see if there was going to be a flag or, or, or whatnot. And the Chanticleers just grabbed it and took it to the house. No time left on the clock here in a second. Wow, Coastal has turned this scoreless game into a 21 to nothing lead in a very short time. And the end of the half, and what a disappointing way for the second quarter to come to an end as Coastal and Georgia Southern head to their respective locker rooms. Big play by special teams. Turnovers costly for the Eagles here in the second quarter and a 21 to nothing lead for Coastal as we head to the break. Halftime, getting ready for the start of the third quarter here at Paulson Stadium in Statesboro, Georgia. Let's take a look at the Sun Belt scoreboard. Of course, Thursday night, Louisiana went over Georgia State. App State, a big victory over Arkansas State today. Now 4-1, and one, they lead the East. Texas State bounces back after a big loss at Louisiana, beats ULM today. Troy wins the Battle of the Belt, knocking off South Alabama 31-24. The two games that stand out to me, first for Georgia State, their defense was on a roll in the last couple of weeks, especially here in Statesboro in the win over Georgia Southern, and they fought to the end against Louisiana. And how about Texas State after losing 45 nothing last week? They answered the call and get a win over Louisiana Monroe. Appalachian State continuing to look strong and continuing to stay on top of the East Division right now as well. And the Eagles still have a date with Appalachian State on the final Saturday of the regular season up in Boone. And App State at 4-1 and one leads the East. Coastal Carolina trying to get back to 4-1 and one and a tie with App State with a win tonight. But regardless, they still have to get some help because they lose a tiebreaker with App State having lost to the Mountaineers 30-27 on a last-second field goal a couple of weeks ago. Hopefully they can get it from either South Alabama, Troy, or maybe even Georgia Southern. That's the Mountaineers' final three games of the season. There's a look at those standings right now, and Coastal gunning for win number eight. That would tie them with Louisiana for the most overall. App, Coastal, Louisiana, the three teams that are already bowl eligible out of the ten in the Sun Belt. And, of course, four new members of the Sun Belt. Today, the fourth of those four officially being announced as James Madison joins the conference. Just an exciting time for the Sun Belt going forward to at least 2023. James Madison, Old Dominion, Marshall, and Southern Miss. It's going to be exciting, especially in the East Division. When you see every year there is always a, a challenge for who can stay atop the East. Louisiana's handled the West for the last couple of years, but the East is going to be very exciting moving forward. Hood's going to take the kickoff from the 12, and Caleb Hood still moving his feet. 
up to the 32, and that's where the Eagles are going to go on offense. That might be their best starting position of the night. It's going to be important to see how they capitalize off of that, and you wonder what the message was in the locker room, especially the final play of the half, resulting in a block punt for a touchdown. Yeah, this will be their seventh offensive possession of the game, and this is their best opening field position. The average field position in the first half was the 15-yard line. So first and 10 for the Eagles from the 33. A lot of the crowd thinned out after halftime or headed for cover underneath the overhang. It has been a miserable night weather-wise as Logan Wright on the carry gets dropped after a short game. Alex Spillum, who blocked that punt at the end of the first half, was in on the tackle. It's all about how you respond to adversity. Logan Wright up the middle following his blockers kind of got hung up top before he was tackled and taken down there. But still a gain of four. Tomlin, five of nine passing, 63 yards in the first half, 10 rushes for 39 yards. But two costly fumbles that led directly or indirectly to Coastal Carolina touchdowns. Gerald Green motors out to the 46-yard line before being tackled by Teddy Gallagher, but that'll be a first down. Gerald Green has been known to make some big plays for the Eagles on offense, and that time just fought, stayed with his blockers on the outside and waited for his moment. You... You had C.J. Brewer on the backside chasing him down. Didn't get there in time. Green got nine on the play. Five carries, 22 yards for Gerald Green tonight. And again, of course, J.D. King is out, still nursing that sore knee. Amari Jones goes in motion behind the line. And right up the middle, Gerald Green. This time gets stopped by C.J. Brewer. Number 52, C.J. Brewer, super senior, playing in his home state tonight. Starred at Bowden High School in West Georgia. Played for the Bowden Red Devils. The Eagles sticking with Green here in the second half. Was able to spin out of one tackle on the outside. It's Kelly that, that got a hand on him, but couldn't hang on. Second down and seven. And Green bounces. He's in trouble. Gets away from the big man. Now just looking to salvage the play. Takes a loss on the play, but gets back close to the original line of scrimmage. He was about to take a huge double-digit loss. And managed to, to get through. That's just a, a missed block from Bo Johnson. Couldn't get there in time. And, you know, it's all Green here just trying to spin out of trouble and just find an opening. So third down and nine. That's the seventh TFL for the Coastal defense tonight. Tomlin, heavy pocket, fires off the hands of Hood. Looked like a catchable ball. He might have taken his eyes off the ball as he saw the defender closing in on him. It took an awkward bounce off of Hood. Plenty of space and time for Tomlin. It's great protection from the O-line. Kind of got pushed as he threw, and it just went right through the hands there. Yeah, he saw the safety, Shaheem Watkins, closing fast, took his eyes off the ball, and it's fourth and nine. Beck, who had his last punt block, stands at the 31 to kick. Little rush this time. And the ball is going to hit behind highly and be downed at the six-yard line. So that's where Coastal will go on offense for the first time here in the third quarter in just a moment. Bryce Carpenter getting the start here tonight in place of the injured Grayson McCall. You see his numbers in the first half, 6 of 10 for 47 yards, ran for a touchdown and threw for a touchdown as well. Six carries for 52, a solid performance in adverse conditions a driving rainstorm that has lasted the entire game and expected to go until at least midnight here in Statesboro toss goes to Bennett Bidden cut it back across the field spin move in the open field and looking for some blocks and Bennett out across the 40 and up to the 41 yard line strong run by Braden Bennett 
able to get to Sean Clears out of trouble. That was a great punt from Anthony Beck to put the Sean Clears in that field position. And Carpenter pitched it out in time for getting hit by Ellis. And that's just great running from Bennett. Spins out of a tackle, going to the outside. He had great blockers. You had six down linemen up front and provided a lot of space when Bennett was able to cut back towards the middle. First and ten. Shamari Jones right up the middle, crashes out across the 50 and to the other side of it. Back-to-back -back big runs by Braden Bennett and Shamari Jones get him from the six all the way across midfield on just two plays. Just solid running so far from Coastal Carolina. You know, once they got out of trouble, they can just really just relax, take enough time off the clock as they can. There's really no pressure right now for them. Shamari Jones takes a big hit right there as the defense was able to recover. Randy Wade and Anthony Wilson were able to get him as he tried to slip into the backside there and make a cut against the defense. He was one of the key players that the offensive coordinators for Coastal Carolina told to keep an eye on, and he came through at the very end. It's a hit stick on Jones and the lower body to take him down. You see him shaking up, heading towards the... On the side. Second TFL for the Eagles defense tonight. Ball at the 49, second and 11. Carpenter heaves it to the outside, and Cameron Brown, Najee Thompson making the tackle. Short pickup right there. Such a unique offensive scheme for the Chanticleers. So a, a dump pass from, from Carpenter giving space. They have two co offensive coordinators in Willie Korn and Newland Isaac, and you know, Jamie, <laughs> Coach Chadwell, you know, calls the plays on offense as well, and it's great to be able to play for an offensive-minded coach. Yeah, they've got a unique situation there. Chadwell calls the plays. They carry the title of co-offensive coordinator. Handoff. Braden Bennett again runs for the first down, down to the 31-32 yard line. And Coastal Carolina, 21-0 lead. They've done that without getting the ball to Javon Hiley tonight, their top wide receiver. And look at this blocking on the outside, especially from Hiley there, able to run right through the gap and get a first down. And that's one of the things the coordinators talk to us about. Not only are they great pass runners, pass route runners, highly and likely, but also great pass blockers out on the perimeter for the running game. Going for the home run, and there's Hiley. They're trying to get it to him right there. Just the second time they've thrown the ball his direction tonight. He knows that, that would have been a touchdown right there. Just didn't cut in close enough. And that was just beautiful protection for Carpenter in the pocket. I mean, look at this play action. Able to get it out and likely beat Baker, the cornerback, just maybe if Carpenter would have waited just a half second longer and then threw it, Hiley would have made a catch and it would have been a touchdown. Hiley, who played at the same high school as Bryce Carpenter. They were high school teammates. Some option right here. Carpenter gets cut down at the 30-yard line. It's going to be third down. How about Coastal Carolina going with some, with some option running here? They've done it a couple of times so far. And normally they, they throw the ball a lot with, with Grayson McCall, but Carpenter is showing he can do a bit of both. He has 105 yards of total offense tonight, about half of it passing, half of it running. Shanta clears three of seven on their thirds in this game. Wide open lane for Carpenter, and he's going to get the first down. He has done that so well tonight. Scored only 23-yard touchdown run back in the second quarter, but he has done a very good job of just taking the open lane and finding the first down marker. With an empty backfield as well, they're expecting a pass on, on third and long, but that just opened up the middle of the field. And Carpenter... 
pretty easily just got through and got the first. And that was one of the things that was so disappointing about the end of the game last week for Georgia Southern, how Georgia State was able to take advantage of the middle of the Georgia Southern defense and drive down and get the winning touchdown. Shamari Jones kicks it to the outside, and Najee Thompson does a good job of holding his position and making the tackle. There's only so much you can do on those outside runs. Jones, you know, he saw both Eagles making his way, making their way towards him, and all I can do is try to go as outside as he can before he cuts in to get through, but Thompson was there. Seems like the range is, is picking up some more here in the second half. Basically just a moving cloud of rain that's sweeping across the stadium. Second down and six, you can hear that popcorn sound. That's the rain hitting the field and hitting our microphones. And Shamari Jones down inside the 10 and close to the first down marker and may have it depending upon the spot. Might be a little bit short. Looks like he will be by about a yard. This is going to be a 10th play. Or that was a 10th play of the drive. And that's going to be, that's going to match the longest drive so far tonight for the Chanticleers. And the Chanticleers have nearly twice as many yards now as the Eagles in this game. 257 total. The Georgia Southerns 137. Now Braden Bennett back there. And he dives forward and gets that first down. Ben Tosway was there on the tackle when it's one yard like that. The Eagles loaded up the box on the inside. Instead, they go with an outside run. And you see Bennett there just lean down, knowing he just needed to dive across and get that yard or two for the, for the first. And hopefully, Tosway's okay. He took a shot to the helmet as he ducked under and was yeah. making a low tackle. We saw it was a similar situation yeah. last week exactly. with cornerback Tyler Bride where he went for a diving tackle and caught a knee to the head. Luckily, he was responsive afterwards. Shamari Jones on the cut. Touchdown, Coastal Carolina. Shamari Jones takes it in. His first down, or his first touchdown score of the night, and it's 27 to nothing. Ninth touchdown on the season for the senior. You see Jones cut towards the left side and just found open space, absorbed the hit from Thompson, leaning into the end zone for a touchdown. And that was a 12-play, 92-yard drive that took nearly seven minutes. The previous two touchdowns that they did score were only three plays right. to get into the end zone off of the fumbles. Recovered by the Chanticleers. At so that time, a, a sustaining drive going all the way downfield and great production from the Chanticleer offense. Showing that they can do it any way they want. 28 nothing lead, Coastal Carolina up four scores here, getting late in the third quarter. Two real stands, uh, fans at the top of the stadium here at Paulson Stadium. That's kind of like the character Lieutenant Dan <laughs> in the middle of the storm and Forrest Gump yeah. in the crow's nest, just refusing, just fighting back with all that he has. They're, they're here to the, the <laughs> stick it out and see it through. Dedicated Georgia Southern fans <laughs> up at the very top of the stands as well. Wow. That's good stuff right there. So the ball comes down at the eight. And Williams will return it. Was that Williams or Burgess? There's two I number 15s. Yeah, there's two number 15s. So I think that was actually Burgess on the yeah. return. And a flag down. Looks like it's going against the Eagles, which will just further continue the theme here of poor field position for Georgia Southern tonight. So earlier this evening, of course, Danny, we were joined by new head coach Clay Helton. Personal foul, League of Black Blood of the Waste, receiving team, number 10. This is to the goal, first down, Georgia Southern. 
Take a look here on the outside left. Yeah, that's a block down low, and that's Darius Lewis on the receiving team for Georgia Southern there. And what I was going to say was just kind of continue our conversation with him in that him taking over here in early November rather than December when typically right. uh, many coaches get hired after the season's already over. He's going to have he has the unique, uh, you know, ability to come in here and not just watch the team in action live, but also be with them and watch in practice and watch you know, how they are in meeting rooms and attendance and all those kind of things, all those important things that coaches don't usually typically get to see. You don't get to see your team actually practice usually until spring football practice. I think that helps because it gives you enough time between the end of the season and then from sp to spring practice to really figure out, okay, here's what we need to do here, here's what we got to adjust here and how we can – you get an early start in making those adjustments for, for when you do coach the next season. So first and 10 following the pass completion. And Tomlin looking to throw, dumps it off here to Logan Wright. Poor pass out of his reach. And I think the other thing that was important uh, when we talked to Coach Helton early in the ball game is he talked about recruiting. And I think that was one of the really important elements of Jared Benko's hiring him before the end of the season. National Signing Day will be the middle of December. If you wait until the end of the season, that's just two weeks before National Signing Day, you really have no chance at all to get a class or get anybody signed on that early date. Right now, the Eagles, I believe, have two commitments in their class. This gives Coach Helton a chance to get in and make connections with the, the kids that are visiting on a you know on a on, on game days as they had here today. There's one more game day coming up with BYU. And also just to start reconnecting with those high school coaches that he's established with in you know past stops and even Southern Cal. It gives you enough time to really find a group of recruits to bring in. He mentioned he already started that today yep. of a couple of hours this morning. Mm -hmm. So already on the phone making those calls and trying to make those connections. So it definitely helps with, with National Signing Day a month away in the middle of December. Different from if, it, if he came in as soon as the season ended. So it's a lot of good for Helton to be able to get on the job early and, and start figuring things out in preparation for the next season as we, he kind of touched on you know he's hands off with the team as far as play calling and right. decision making like that during the on the field during the game and with the players so he can focus on recruiting and kind of get things started and get things going for for next season when he takes over and of course the uh, kind of the elephant in the room but it's pretty obvious not only are the players being evaluated but so the coaching staff as well and that's that's where you got to really hand it to the coaches. We talked to Doug Roos. We talked to Scott Sloan this week, the two coordinators, and just their professionalism throughout all this. I mean, it's a tough spot. It's a business for them, and this is their profession. And now there's a new coach on board, and their futures, of course, are in flux. So here we go. We're headed to the bottom of the third quarter here. And Coastal Carolina going back on offense up by 28. Having a good time here at Paulson Stadium tonight. That's the Coastal Carolina fans. 28-0. Shanta clears the 21st ranked team in the country in command here late in the third quarter as they go back on offense. So all you can do is have fun if you're a Shanta Clear fan. You, you made the, the trip. It's four hours from Conway to Statesboro, and they, your team is up. They want to enjoy it, and might as well just take advantage of, of the elements and just have some fun with it out there. They are doing that. Coastal has done a really good job of taking advantage of Georgia Southern mistakes tonight. Highly hurdles the defender and close to the first down. I think that the drive is where, is where you'll see the Shanta players try to utilize guys like Likely and Highly a little bit more. Just great athleticism from from likely there. Wow. Just, wow. Wow, indeed. Yeah, he's a giant with incredible athleticism. Somebody's gonna is gonna take him in the draft. You have to you have to believe that. Oh, absolutely. Forward. I mean, I think the question is, does he go in the first round? I mean, he's got the skill set. There's no doubt about that. And here is 
a fumble, and the Eagles, I think, have recovered it. I think they, they may have it. So the Eagles get their first turnover of the night. That has to help. And C.J. Wright came up with the ball as well. Let's see what happened here. You have Likely running across the middle. And as soon as he went down, I think it was stripped out by Justin Ellis there. That was actually Tyson Mobley on the catch and run. Mobley, yeah. And then Mobley lost it trying to get a few more yards on the play. And a man down right now. I can't tell who that is right now. Najee Thompson, perhaps. Yeah, number six, you're right. Najee Thompson. That's the last thing the Eagles need. Nobody wants to see anybody get hurt, but the Eagles just cannot afford any more injuries on the defensive side of the ball. They have just been waylaid by injuries in particular. And you see Najee Thompson not able to put any pressure whatsoever on that left leg. He took over as the starting cornerback in the absence of Tyler Bride. Let's see what happens here on the bottom oh, left side you of your can scroll. See it. Oh, no. Yeah, you can see it is not a pretty scene right there. Well, last week we saw something similar happen to C.J. Wright, and he was able to bounce back, and so hopefully that will be the case for Najee Thompson, but the replay did not look good. So the Eagles take over at the 45. Best starting field position of the entire game for them. Comes after the fumble by Mobley. And Tomlin going up top, and he throws it right back to the Chanticleers. Intercepted. Intercepted by Derek Bush, the corner. And the Eagles give a break, and they give a break right back to Coastal. Third turnover of the night for Justin Tomlin. You have to understand that the Eagles trying to go for a big play on first down off of a turnover, but Tomlin just overthrew his, his target in Hood. The defense for Coastal Carolina, that's been the big story throughout this game tonight, and special teams as well. Yeah, I said the third turnover. You count the block punt, obviously, as a turnover as well. That's actually four. Two fumble recoveries. An interception, a block punt, scoop and score, and Coastal goes back on offense again, up 28 to nothing. Nothing doing on the run right there by Shamari Jones. With Najee Thompson out for, like for Georgia Southern, you're going to see Deontay Bembry take over and now another man down. Or Michael Edwards, he looks like he's favoring his left arm and shoulder. He looked like he was trying to come out, but nobody's come in for him yet. Yep, now they're coming in for him. So John Ferguson will check in for him. You see he's favoring that left arm. Carpenter. Gets a couple of yards on the play. That was Quinn Williams, I think, who tripped him up. Third down. Approaching the final minute of this third quarter. Defense has been hit by injuries all season long. So, you know, you talk about Michael Edwards and also Eldrick Robinson, the middle linebacker, the freshman. They were, before the season started, were running reps with the fourth team yeah. <laughs> inside linebacker group. And, and then became starters just a couple of weeks later, trying to lead the charge in the middle. Third down and five. Long pass and a catch by Latushko. And that will be a first down for the Chanticleers. Greg Latushko, senior wideout from New Jersey, ran it just long enough and far enough to pick up the first down. Final half minute of the quarter. And 
Shamari Jones. Another run. Jones has gotten the bulk of the work at running back here tonight with Reese White out with an injury. That was the 17th carry for Shamari Jones, who has a shot at a 100-yard rushing game. So he'll finish up that third quarter with right at 85 yards rushing, heading to the fourth and a 28 to nothing lead for Coastal as we head to the final period. Quarter, Coastal Carolina leading Georgia Southern. These two teams have been comparable in their rushing attacks this season, ranking top 15 in the nation. But tonight, Danny, it's been all Coastal, 224 yards rushing. And the Eagles have only 77. One thing to keep an eye on, only 55 yards against Appalachian State, and that was the one game they lost. So for Deshaun to clear that they can have a solid running game, they're more than likely to come out with a win. And it's, it's rare when someone's able to outrush Georgia Southern being known as a, as a dominant running game team throughout the season. Eagles have managed just 160 yards of total offense tonight. And it's third and four coming up for Coastal. And Coastal's well below their typical numbers, too. I think the conditions have had a lot to do with that as they've thrown for only 85 yards tonight with Grayson McCall on the bench with his injury. I think that's the big question for the Chanticleers going forward, Danny, is just how seriously is Grayson McCall injured? They look like they will likely pick up their eighth win tonight. Carpenter is able to pick it up on the bounce. And he goes down back inside the five-yard line at the three. Reed Dedman will get credit for that tackle. That one slipped through the hands of Carpenter right there. The shots clear have done a great job being able to hang on to the ball. They haven't had many turnovers until the first one last quarter. And Carpenter tried to create something with it at the last second, but notices... He was close to the end zone. He just fell down. And when Reed Dedman made that tackle, he nearly stripped him again because he took a swipe at it, pulled at his arm, and the arm moved a little bit, and the ball bobbled in his hands. He was able to retain possession, but now Overson is punting from the end zone. Line drive kick away from Hood. He'll take it on the bounce at the 45-yard line, and they're going to rule that he called a fair catch, I guess. Never seen a fair yeah. catch on a bounce, but the official blew the whistle. Even the Santa Clara players are like, I, he didn't call a fair catch there. And, and he, Let's you know. see if we can see. Does the arm go up? That left hand right at the very beginning. But it, he didn't it, raise it over his head. I, maybe the official... Dottie did. I'm not sure, but, I, but I from know, that I, angle, I, we didn't see a, a, a fair catch yeah. be called there. Typically, the fair catch is you raise the arm over your head. He did not. His arm did flash out, but I think that was more a function of him running as Cam Ransom has now checked in the game at quarterback. So the freshman getting a chance to take the snaps here in the fourth quarter. Let's see what he can do. And Jalen White tripped up by Boykin at the 37 and Ransom was down there trying to throw a block. I think he's eager to be in the game. <laughs> well he's 6'3", 215 pounds and also the second carry for Jalen White tonight. Burst of speed trying to break to the outside. He tried to keep going and there goes Ransom knock, knocking down Tobias Fletcher there in the back. Man, he gets a helmet sticker for me from me for that play. <laughs> Just hustling down there and trying to get a block. Fires the ball to the outside. That's complete to Burgess, who makes a cut to the outside. And down to the 26 and a first down for the Eagles. Freshman the freshman connection there from Ransom to Burgess. And what's interesting to keep an eye out for, Matt, uh, Ransom a left-handed quarterback as well. Yep. He did have some impressive throws in the beginning of the season where he started, the, where he did play a lot in the first two games before Justin Tomlin came back. So first and 10, ball at the 26-yard line. Chanticleer showing some blitz. It's coming from the backside. Ransom delivers downfield to Burgess again. And that's going to be a first down inside the 10-yard line. So Ransom has him down in scoring position inside the 10. 
with a couple of passes to Burgess. Ransom can throw the ball once again, finding his freshman target on the on the left side compared to the right side in the last play. This is great momentum for Georgia Southern on this drive. Well, you know, when you're going through a losing season, quite frankly, with the fans quite often, the most popular player is the backup quarterback. And so they're getting a chance to see Ransom play here as he hands off to Jalen White. And he gets a couple of yards down to the six. There was a question as to, to who was going to be the starting quarterback in the beginning of the year with Tomlin out. And, you know, all of the quarterbacks that the Eagles have are great in practice, but Tomlin had had the most exper game experience out of all of them. And Amari Jones, who's a man of many hats, he actually started as quarterback in the season opener against Gardner-Webb. Second down and six. Ransom throwing and touchdown to Bo Johnson. Touchdown Georgia Southern Eagles as they finally get on the board here with just under 11 minutes to play in the fourth quarter. Johnson had a touchdown last week against Georgia State and simple flat route from Johnson untouched on the outside. That's the second touchdown on the season for Ransom. Looks like the Eagles are going to go for two. I agree with that. Might as well. Ransom guns it. Two-point conversion to Derwin Burgess. And it's 28 to 8. So the Georgia Southern Eagles get on the board here in the fourth quarter. Cam Ransom, the freshman, comes in off the bench and directs the touchdown drive. Gus down there helping the fans take some selfies in Georgia Southern with a touchdown on the drive by Cam Ransom. Be interesting to see uh, you know, he'll be able to do here in the fourth quarter. His first series was successful. And now let's see if the uh, Eagles try something here on this kickoff. If not an onside, at least a kind of a sky ball over that uh, initial line to try to drop it in there. And there's the onside kick. It doesn't go 10 yards, however. In fact, it goes all the way backwards. I don't know that I've ever seen a kick that goes zero yards. I haven't seen anything like that before <laughs> where a kick where that a went kick zero just, yards. It went up and then just rolled back there at the at the very end. Free kick. Out of bounds. Kicking team. Five yards would be added to where the ball went out of bounds. First down, Coastal Carolina. I understand trying to add, add momentum <laughs> after, the, after the touchdown pass from, from Ransom, but look at that ball. It just spins and spins backwards there. Yeah. Uh, no disrespect, but that's a candidate for the not top 10. <laughs> a <think> zero so. <laughs> yard kickoff. Never seen that before, and I've called a lot of games. So Coastal with the zero yard kickoff and the five yard penalty takes over at the 30 yard line. Carpenter gonna go under. Eagles read it well that time. Eldrick Robinson leading the charge. That time he was swarm. There was nowhere for him to go. Carpenter, that is, wanted to pitch it out, but you had multiple Eagles just surrounding him and getting past the offensive line. Eldrick Robinson, we talked to Scott Sloan about those freshman inside linebackers. He said inconsistent, but at the same time, as inconsistent as they've been, they've really had some nice plays this season as well, thrust into action a lot earlier than had been anticipated when they were signed. And that was Eldrick Robinson coming right up the middle and blasting Carpenter as he delivered the incomplete pass. He put a hit on Carpenter there. Just went through untouched. Luckily, Carpenter got it out in time. 
You see here, look at that open space on the left side. There was nobody there to cover to cover Robinson. And Hiley, you know, almost had it, had the reception, but dropped out of his hands at the very end. Third and 13, and my goodness, nice job of tackling there by Eldrick Robinson as well to lead with the shoulder and not the helmet. And the play gets blown dead, or did a timeout get called? I think a timeout got called. You saw, you saw Carpenter trying to tell his team to get down, but Sean Cliff have to burn a timeout here with 10 10 in the fourth quarter. Coming out of the timeout here in the fourth quarter. Third down and 13 as you take a look at Coastal's remaining schedule. Georgia State is next at Brooks Stadium. Then Texas State, they'll close their regular season schedule at South Alabama. If they play in the Sun Belt Championship game for the first time ever, they'll have to win out and get some help and have someone beat App along the way. You'll remember they did win the East last year, but the championship game was not played with Louisiana. They were declared co-champions with the Raging Cajuns because of COVID. And that was unfortunate because the Sun Belt put on a great show in all last season. I think a lot of people wanted to see Coastal Carolina sure. versus Louisiana in the championship game. Also, for the final three games for the Shock to Clear, they'll actually have some consistency because they played all throughout the week, throughout the season, playing games on Wednesdays, on, on Thursdays, on Fridays, but they'll have a, two more Saturday games against Georgia State and Texas State and then South Alabama on a Friday after Thanksgiving. End over end kick that's going to go into the end zone, so the ball will come out to the 20-yard line. For the Eagles, a chance to see Cam Ransom running the offense for a second time. We saw Ransom make great progress. He was a perfect three for three on that drive and also converting the two point conversion as well. So, you know, great opportunity here to give your freshman quarterback some more snaps here in the fourth. And if he scores again here on this drive, it's just great production and gives you momentum. When you go back out on defense again. He was able to direct a five-play, 45-yard drive after the fumble had gifted the Eagles their best field position of the night. Ransom will hand off to Jalen White. He gets dropped for a loss. Got swallowed up immediately by Josiah Stewart, who had a quarterback sack earlier in the game and now a TFL here in the fourth quarter. It just seemed like there, were, there was too much time in, a, in the handoff exchange there, and, and Stewart was able to get past the Eagles' own line and get a TFL. Second down and 14. Ransom out of Armwood High School in Lakeland, Florida, down in the Tampa area. And Ransom going to run and step out of bounds at the 21-yard line. Got about five on the play. The wise decision from Ransom had time in the pocket, but once Stewart got through on the outside, you got to just break out of the pocket and run out of bounds. Third down and eight. Under nine to go now. Ramson, Ransom looks to the sideline and gets the play call. The OC, Doug Roos, down on the sideline. That's been new since the change in head coach. And Ransom takes a sack back at the 11. Did not see Josiah Stewart coming from the blind side in his second quarterback sack of the night. How about the freshman Stewart just working the right tackle and redshirt senior and Caleb Kelly. Three straight plays where Stewart's able to break out of the outside a tackle for loss, and now a sack as well. Second sack of the game. That's right. And when we talked to the coaching staff this week, that was the guy that they singled out as the one that has really impressed them this season. And why not? Freshman out of Everett, Massachusetts. Same place, same town, same Everett, uh, same Everett High School that produced uh, Isaiah Likely, the tight end. 
Long kick by Beck, gonna flip the field as Hiley goes all the way back to the 30 to get it and then gets dropped at the 26. And that's where the Chanticleers will go on offense after we step aside for this timeout. Under eight to play here and 28-8 lead for Coastal Carolina today. James Madison officially joining the Sunbelt Conference following in the footsteps of Southern Miss, Old Dominion, and Marshall last week. 16 teams now in the Sunbelt Conference when these two teams, or four teams actually, uh, end up playing in league play in the years to come. 2023, pardon me. That's beautiful. I mean... The, the Sun Belt really had a lot of high-profile profile games last season. Great job there by the Eagles defense. Michael, Andrew Edwards. <laughs> Michael Edwards and Andrew Johnson Jr. there on the tackle. But the Sun Belt had a great showing last season, and it just showed and other teams took notice and wanted to join the conference. You see this every couple of years where you see a realignment in multiple conferences. I mean, you see the SEC getting two more teams in Texas and Oklahoma in the AAC losing a couple of teams to the Big 12, so the Big 12 able to get some more teams there. Conference USA, a, a, a mass exodus from, from a lot of teams leaving there, but they picked up a couple here this week, and the Sun Belt is getting stronger, adding four teams. And some would think the Sun Belt could be one of the best G5 conferences going forward. I think they certainly are challenging uh, the American Conference. I think it had been widely considered the, the American was the top group of five, but yeah. I think the Sun Belt with these additions of Southern Miss and Old Dominion, Marshall and now James Madison that's moving up from FCS, much like Georgia Southern did, much like Coastal Carolina did. You see Baker got injured on that play. He's still having some trouble getting mobile. But that Eastern Division is an absolute beast. What would likely be the Eastern Division in the yeah. Sun Belt. You now have Marshall, James Madison, Old Dominion, App State, Coastal Carolina, Georgia Southern, and Georgia State in all likelihood in the Sun Belt Football East Division. Troy would move from the East to the West. And just that was what you want to see from Georgia Southern with Najee Thompson on crutches, Daryl Baker. Now being helped off the field and a lot of... I mean, the defense has here. just been snake-bitten this season with injuries. Most notably, yeah. all-conference cornerback Derek Canteen going down in the second game of the season. It's kind of been a domino effect, it seems, at that cornerback position this year. Let's see who they've got lined up uh, at corner. I see Seth Robertson over on the far side, and that looks like Justin Birdsong, perhaps the, the safety, has kind of taken on a, a corner slot. Well, Birdsong was a corner when he first came to, to Georgia Southern before he was moved to the safety spot. So in this situation, Birdsong going back to the cornerback's position. And you see 18 Birdsong out there. And it's going to be fourth down, and Coastal's going to have to punt here, or was the timeout called? Looks like a timeout called by Coastal on fourth and two. Going back to how the Sun Belt Conference could look, I mean, you mentioned how the East is going to be, but you can't forget the West with Southern Miss being able to join the West Division there, it'll make for an interesting time. I mean, right now, it, it seems like it's Louisiana versus everyone else at the moment. They've won the last three seasons, the West Division, that is. Yeah. But you see Butch Jones, of course, they're taking their lumps this year, but Butch Jones, uh, former Power Five head coach at Arkansas State, Terry Bowden, uh, former Power Five coach, there at ULM and now Clay Helton former power five coach taking over here at Georgia Southern it's a great thing to see and, you, and you've seen it the other way around for for coaches mainly at Appalachian State where they've had a coach come in for one year and then go to a power five school 
Seen Scott Satterfield going to, to Louisville. Ball is fumbled, and Coastal, I think, is on top of it at the 26-yard line. Caleb Hood short-armed the ball, might have slid a little bit, had some trouble with his footing as the ball was coming down in the air, and it's recovered by Hiley at the 26. Special teams getting the job done once again for the Chanticleers. Hood just could not hang on. That's been a recurring thing throughout the game. It happened on kick return in the first half. Yeah, he backpedaled too much to where he was not underneath the ball. And so Coastal takes over at the 26 with six and a half to go. Just been an all-round miserable night for the Eagles as the Chanticleers close in on win number eight this year. You look at what they've been able to do the last two years under Jamie Chadwell, 11 and one last year. Six and a half minutes away from beating eight and one this year, 19 and two in their last 21 games. It's a big turnaround from last from go, starting from last season to now, the way they've been able to just be able just to have great a great year and be able to carry that momentum going forward. You know, and, and we had a great conversation with Coach Chadwell earlier this week after the CFP rankings came out, and he was disappointed, just like many people around the nation, uh, talking about how Cincinnati got shut out of the top four. And, you know, he didn't talk a lot about Coastal, but I was disappointed for Coastal, too. This is a team that had been ranked as high as 14, yeah. was 21 in the poll this week, but was not included in the top 25 of the CFP. It's hard because, you know, you get knocked from your schedule, you get knocked for your schedule because it's not tough, but the Chanticleers had a, had a strong schedule early in non-conference. They beat Kansas, had a, had a win against Buffalo as well at Buffalo. And, you know, going from 14 to 21, that was kind of, that was a big drop. I, I didn't think they needed to get dropped that far off of just one loss, and it was a three-point loss to a really good Appalachian State team. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, I think the point that Jamie Chadwell was, make, was making is well taken. Uh, when you lose and you're a group of five team in the rankings, you're going to take a bigger hit than the Power Five team. If that had been a Power Five team losing to a rival in the conference who, by the way, had been a four-time champion up until last year, you wouldn't have dropped seven points on a field goal loss at the Horn. And with there being a change in, in all the conferences right now in college football, one can hope there's a change in the college football playoff going forward as well. Well, again, those frustrations being voiced, I was watching uh, Kurt Herbstreet this morning, and he was very frustrated with the Cincinnati situation and a lot of people, a lot of critics have been very vocal about how it increasingly seems apparent that in the current structure of the four-team CFP, a group of five team just is not going to be included. We've seen undefeated UCF teams not be included. We've seen Cincinnati rank number two in the polls, right. but six in the CFP. Hopefully that, hopefully that changes, uh, especially with the next CFP coming out on Tuesday. Michigan State, who was ranked number, third, ranked number three, lost to Purdue today. Right now, Oregon is down 9-3 to Washington. Cincinnati won their game earlier against Tulsa 28-20, so there, there is hope that they'll probably go up to five. Some would hope that they go to four. I mean, Ohio State's at five, and they won their, their game against Nebraska. Right. But there, there's still a chance, and you know Alabama, they're up 14-7 right now on LSU, but that could always change as well. A lot of things always have to happen in order for them to get into the top four, and even if that happens, they're not guaranteed, as, as we've kind of been talking about here for the last few minutes and how Cincinnati just hasn't gotten the respect that they deserve throughout this season. Third down and 12 right here. Carpenter dumps it off, and Gravette is able to hold on to it, but a very minor gain on the play, and now it's going to be fourth down. Xavier Gravette, the tight end, first catch of the night for him. 
while he was trying to hang on. He got hit underneath by Edwards. And, and going back to yeah. our CFP conversation real quick. Yes, I want for Cincinnati to get some respect, but at the same time, um, there's a selfish part of me that wants to see this continue so this perhaps moves us to a 12-team playoff. They're going to have to change it to a 12-team playoff some point down the road, especially now where you have multiple teams, multiple conferences. As the Eagles make a great stop, turnover on downs. So the ball goes over on downs as Carpenter had nobody open on fourth and 12. And goes down at the 17. Surprising they didn't go for a field goal there. Carpenter kind of hit a little bit as, as Reed Deadman kind of blew things up in the back. I just think in these conditions, it's just too risky. I mean, the, the, a missed field goal here is not what you're really concerned about. In these conditions, a block and maybe a scoop and return score opportunity might be a little bit more likely in these kind of poor weather conditions. So I think the risk of lining up for a field goal that really doesn't mean a whole lot to you, the, the risk of something bad happening is greater than the risk of something good. Well, the Sean DeClaire's... Or the benefit of something good. They, they risk going perfect on fourth down. They were seven out of seven before that, and... His knee hit the ground. The Sean DeClaire's were seven for seven in fourth down conversion. That was the first time this season they, they were unable to convert a first on, on fourth down. You'll see that Darius Lewis here. Personal foul, rough from the passer, defense, number 32. 15-yard penalty, automatic, first down. So, yeah. Just a little shove there, inadvertent, but uh, a shove nonetheless. He just came in there kind of off balance and ran into him more than anything else. So that'll move the sticks. The completion, by the way, Lewis caught the ball with his knee on the ground, and that's why the play got blown dead immediately. And then you have the 15-yard penalty for the markoff, bringing the ball out to the 32. Ransom fires to the outside, and that's going to be incomplete. Bo Johnson, the intended target, he caught the one touchdown pass for the Eagles tonight. See there, just couldn't come down with it the very end. This is good momentum for Ransom here in the, in the final three minutes and change. A great opportunity to, to get some reps here. On offense. Second down and 10. Well, another touchdown drive here would no doubt uh, fuel the message boards. Uh, they've been calling for him to start for a while. Uh, not that that means anything, but that would no doubt be fuel to the fire for them. If Ransom could lead the Eagles on another touchdown drive, this is a nice completion over the top of the defense there. Dropped it between two defenders to Caleb Hood. Found Hood in space. Complete to Hood again at the 41-yard line. And one last piece of news on the college football playoff conversation. News this week that the uh, committee has tabled discussion about expansion until after December 1st. Ransom throws, and that's completed the 31. Nope, couldn't hold on to it. Lewis could not take it to the ground. Second down and one. Third down and one, pardon me. That was second down right there. Third down and one. And first down run by Logan Wright and a bit more as well down to the 29. That's all day for Logan Wright. I mean, being a big power back, he can easily push his way through for the first and got it and then some. 11 yard pickup, 10 carries, 35 yards for Wright. Ransom scrambling. Flag out, might have a hold here as he dumps it to the end zone. They got, got rep in the face mask there as he was trying to break out of the pocket. So that was a free play for Georgia Southern. They're going to get a couple of yards there. Do we have multiple penalties is the question. Personal foul, face mask, 
defense, number zero, half the distance to the goal, automatic first down. I think everyone, all the referees just saw <laughs> the face mask, the blatant face mask there. Stewart's done great for Coastal Carolina, but right there, yep. you, know, you can't do that. Just a blatant right hand on the face mask. And, and Ransom, you know, credit to Ransom for trying to keep the play alive. He almost had a man on the outside for a touchdown there. So first and 10, ball at the 14 as the Eagles have taken advantage of two personal foul penalties called on hits or face mask penalties against Ransom. In the pocket, and he gets sacked again. I was about to say, it might be another one. because Josiah Stewart, his third quarterback sack of the night. He took him down, but watch how, how Stewart takes Ransom down here. Ransom tried to break out and kind of around, around the horse collar a little bit. Pass complete. Ball is nearly intercepted as it goes flying out of the hands of Amari Jones. Popped out of the, I guess as soon as Jones got hit, it popped out of his hands. Third down and 15. Heavy rush, Ransom in trouble, and the ball out on the sack by Stewart. And let's see who's got on top of it. Eagles retain possession as Khalil Crowder was able to get on top of that fumble, but this might be sack number four for Stewart. I'm telling you what, Stewart's going to have a great career in Holy the Sun Belt co Conference. I mean, the way he has been playing tonight. You know, outside of the, of the face mask penalty there, had a solid game. Ransom on fourth down, delivers, and nearly intercepted inside the 10-yard line. And the ball's going to go over on downs. Four sacks for Josiah Stewart, five TFL tonight. You think he might be the conference defensive player of the week? This is pretty much a no-brainer <laughs> at, at this moment, the way he, he played tonight. Unreal performance by Josiah Stewart as he was almost a one-man wrecking ball on that drive to keep the Eagles from scoring here late in the fourth quarter. Got to give credit to Ransom, though. He really tried to, to create something downfield for the Eagles. And now Jared Guest is going to finish this game up for the Chanticleers at quarterback. Redshirt sophomore playing back in his home state. He's from Marietta, Georgia. Played at Kennesaw Mountain High School. And getting a little bit deeper on the depth chart here. A carry by number 25, Christian Malloy. Malloy, if I'm not mistaken, that's, he's another Georgia kid getting a chance to play here in his home state tonight. Yep, was out of Lilburn, played at Parkview High School. This will probably be the final play of the game here. It's just a matter of do they uh, give a handoff or just take a knee. It'll be a handoff. And that will be the final play of this ball game. So the time winding down, Coastal Carolina, the number 21 team in the nation, is going to win this one here tonight in a driving rainstorm for the entire game. 28 to 8, the final, as the Chanticleers improve to 8 and 1 on the season, 4 and 1 in the conference. Eagles drop number four in a row as they'll go on the road next week. 28-8 the final. We'll come back and wrap it up in a moment.
number 21, Coastal Carolina, 28-8 victory over Georgia Southern as the Chanticleers improved to 4-1 and one and remain in a first-place tie with App State atop the Sunbelt Eastern Division as you take a look at the final box score. The four turnovers for Georgia Southern, costly in particular in that second quarter, two fumbles and a blocked punt that led to 21 points and effectively blew the game open. Even though offense scored three of those four touchdowns, it was all defense and special teams that really carry things for the Chanticleers with a 28-8 win over the Eagles tonight. And how about Josiah Stewart, the freshman defensive end for the Chanticleers? Four quarterback sacks, an additional TFL, so five total tackles for loss in the game. No doubt the front runner for Sunbelt Defensive Player of the Week. Defensive Player of the Week and potentially Freshman of the Year as well. Just what a performance from Stewart there at the end. and. Was made a big difference in the Chanticleers win. Now it's going to be interesting to see how the final three games play out for both Coastal Carolina and Appalachian State fighting for a top of the East division. Coastal's got Georgia State next. Georgia Southern on the road against Texas State. 28-8 the final. And now for Danny Waugh and our entire ESPN team, I'm Matt Stewart. Good night from rainy and cold Statesboro, Georgia, where the Chanticleers win big.